Saddle Hunters, our brothers over at Tethered, continue to kill the game by releasing innovative products. They just recently put out the Eberhardt Series Saddle. They also put out the Menace Saddle, which is for our, our Husky brothers and sisters that are into saddle hunting. That does that, that saddle will do just maybe a little bit better job of cupping your quote-unquote assets. But the thing that I'm most excited about is their recent release of the Tethered One Climbing Stick. Um, this thing is crazy light, crazy strong, and crazy quiet. I'm just going to cut to the chase here and give you some specs. Each stick weighs in at less than one pound. That includes your Dynalite rope attachment. Uh, a three-pack of these will weigh in at 2.7 pounds, which is ridiculously light. It's a 17-inch step-to-step uh, single stick uh, sing- single stick height, and there's an 8.5-inch uh, step footbed, which gives you plenty of room for, for those of us folks with, with, with bigger feet. It's all made with aerospace-grade titanium and aluminum for construction. So if you'd like to learn more about Tether's innovative products, Head over to tetherednation.com and check them out. The first thing I do in the morning before a hunt, before a scout, or just before getting ready for work is have my morning coffee, and I'm sure most of you out there listening are the same. Make sure you're filling your mug with Skull Brew Coffee, as it is the only coffee company that is both 2% for conservation certified and donates 10% of its profits to conservation organizations to help secure the future of our wild places. So head to skullbrewcoffee.com and choose between three killer roasts of coffee and know that you are supporting conservation with every sip. Welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 205. Today I'm joined again by Steve Shirk as we are wrapping up another DIY report mini-series all about hunting mature mountain bucks during post-rut and beyond. So stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. We are rolling into another week of the DIY report. This is the last one. It might be the last one for the year. Um, So as you're listening to this, if there are topics you want me to jump into um, and dive into more deeply, uh, send me a message on Instagram or email me or something. Always interested to see what you guys want to hear. Um, happy to kind of try to dig that that information up. But as we sit here, well, before we get started, let me just say this. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So happy, happy Thanksgiving. Usually my plans over Thanksgiving, or at least my plan this year, was um, head back to the in-laws <clears throat> for the Thanksgiving dinner or lunch, I should say. And then what I typically do is, you know, because I'm that much closer to Ohio, because I live you know, right outside Philadelphia. Um, I was going to take the travel trailer with me this trip and uh, essentially finish up my my meal, jump in the truck in the travel trailer and head to Ohio um, to a spot that I've hunted for a couple of different years. Um, I killed a good buck there a couple years a couple years ago. Have kind of a little honey hole that I've that I found, and my plan was to go back there and hunt uh, Friday and Saturday. But uh, as fate would have it, that is not going to happen. Um, the, the in-laws in the entire group of in-laws has the, has the Rona. So brother-in-law, mother-in-law, father-in-law. So the entire, the entire clan has it. So we won't be headed back there, uh, for the, for the holiday. We'll be staying put here at home. Um, which I guess is just as well. You know, I have a couple deer around here that I have yet to, to, to run into. Um, and so I'll probably end up trying to get out into the timber on, it looks like the weather is going to cooperate probably, you know, Thursday morning, maybe I think it's supposed to rain a little bit, but not be too bad. And then, um, Friday, uh, Friday looks to be pretty good. So I'm probably going to be out all day, all day Friday and try to try to get it done. So what I did this past week, I I ended up hunting on Saturday, um, and ended up having an encounter with one of the shooters, uh, that I had on, that I had on camera and I completely screwed the pooch on this thing. Um, I, I got into the tree set up feeling good overcast day. I think the high was going to be, you know, maybe right around 60 degrees, 58, 60 degrees. So maybe a little unseasonably warm, but you know, it was right along some water. So the temp was definitely, you know, pretty chilly and, uh, slipped in access was killer in this, this particular spot. I think this was maybe the, the third hunt in this particular spot that I had, that I had this year. Um, so I've not hunted it a ton and I hadn't been back to this spot since, uh, since before I left for, um, before I left for Missouri. So it would have had to been like somewhere around like the 22nd, 23rd, something like that of October is probably the last time I was in there. So it was, bit, it was pretty close to, you know, a, m- a month out, right around a month out since I had last been in there. 
And uh, I had some, I have a cell camera that's in that general area, and I was getting some 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 pictures saying that there were some does that were hitting this one primary scrape area where I had gotten a couple really good bucks on on camera. So I ended up making my making my way into that setup. Um, got all set up, you know first light, you know, was around six something, six forty five, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And then I think, you know, by like seven ish, it was, you know, daylight out. I think sunrise officially was like seven twenty or something like that. Um, so I'm in the tree and it's a little after seven, you know, light out. Um, I'm not, you know, haven't seen anything yet to this point, which isn't, which isn't surprising. Squirrels are out, of course, you know, booner squirrels making noise. And, uh, you know, my, what I was anticipating, I had a northeast, or I'm sorry, a, a slightly northwest um, wind. And most of the, what I had seen from hunting this spot, whenever I, the, the one buck encounter I had at this spot, the deer come from the northeast. That was a lot of the camera intel that I was getting too. Um, they will sometimes come from the, from the southeast. And like, there's a scrape that was right behind me. So the setup really is there's a scrape kind of 15 yards in front of me that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to shoot to. And then on my way in, you know, the last time I was in, and again, this time there is a scrape that's been worked on the, on the way in and all the deer trails in this bottoms piece that are kind of close to the water, not surprisingly are kind of running north and north and south. We'll say, right. Uh, you know, perpendicular to the, to the water. Um, and this is important. The reason this is important is because I'll, I'll get to it here in a, here in a second. Cause this was kind of my aha moment. And I figured out maybe what I might be doing wrong in this spot. So get into the tree. Everything's good to go. I thought I heard something kind of to my, off to my right shoulder, you know, which would have been directly to like the East and wasn't really paying it a ton of attention because I didn't, it sounded like squirrels, number one. And number two, um, I had not seen on camera or even in the, in, in the tree myself, seen any deer come from that particular area. So that was like the least of my concerns. And actually, was kind of where I was planning and wanting to kind of dump my scent to a degree. There was zero wind when I got in there. Um, you know, like, like I said, there was a little bit of a Northwest wind, but at this point in the day, like the day winds hadn't picked up yet. So there was nothing. My milk, milkweed, I was checking. It was just dropping straight to the bottom of my tree pretty much. So as I'm sitting there, I continue to hear this rustling and there's all this like brush. that's kind of round that birds are flying in and out of the previous times I've been hunting there. And so I just kind of expected that's what it was. Well, at this point, I kind of look over my right shoulder. And when I say my right shoulder, I mean, it's almost like directly off to the side of me, uh, off to my weak side in a saddle. And I look over there and I see a deer. And of course, I, my immediate immediate first thought was that it was going to be going to be a doe because um, that's, you know, what I had seen a lot on camera. And I just didn't expect there you know to be anything other than that maybe popping out that that early. So I saw a deer. I could tell that it was deer. Couldn't tell how big it was or what it was, you know, so I didn't grab my bow. First mistake. Um, as I'm sitting there, he starts, uh, this deer starts to pop its head through the brush a little bit, you know, or at least kind of clear the brush a little bit. And at this point he's getting close enough that I can see that it's a buck. Now, you know, uh, the deer that I had seen whenever I had hunted there previously was like this, you know, forky four point, um, young deer, and he's been all over that camera during rut in here leading into like the post rut activity and stuff like that. That's the main buck that I've seen since basically the beginning of November. You know, he's been the most active. Um, and so I thought that that's the deer that it was. So I still didn't pick up my bow. Mistake number two, as he cleared the brush and I could actually see which one it was. There was really three deer on this in this particular area that I've had on camera that were um, shooter worthy. There was a there was a, a very big one. Um you know, I'm not going to venture a score, but I think I've mentioned him in the past. You, you would shoot, most people would shoot him, whether you're in Ohio, even Iowa, Missouri, wherever he's a big, he's a big deer, not just for PA, but just in general. Um, and then there were, uh, another eight point, which was a really nice Pennsylvania eight. He was probably around 125 to 130 inches, which is great for me for public land, killing that all day, probably a three and a half year old. And then there was another one that was an eight that had a really big left side, and then a smaller right side, but just really, really wide. Again, probably a, a little bit younger. He might be like a two and a half year old, um, but still a good deer for the area for public land. And that was, you know, the third one on my on my list. And as he cleared the brush, I could clearly see that it was that it was that deer. Um, at this point now, I pick up my bow, and he's not coming, you know, like running. He's just kind of doing the, you know post rut looking for a doe, you know, or end of, end of rut looking for a doe zombie walk. Um, so as he's walking out and he's walking toward me, 
I grab my bow and now I'm in a position to where he's at a spot where I, I wasn't going to be able to shoot him on my weak side by just coming over my bridge. What I really needed to do was kind of pivot, turn around and, and shoot him like a strong side shot, but, but standing or leaning away from my tree and backwards, right? Which is a, an easy shot to take and it's a fine shot to make, except you need a hot second just to make that turn or at least some some cover to make that turn. And where he was coming out of was like, was the only spot that I didn't have a ton of cover. Once he broke that brush line, there wasn't a whole lot between he and I. So I just kind of stand, stood still, had my bow in my hand, you know, my release obviously was already clipped on. And so he's now kind of angling toward that scrape. And I'm like, you know what, this isn't a big deal. I'm not going to make an aggressive move and, and potentially spook him. He's not hit my scent yet. Cause it's kind of dropping to the bottom of the tree. He's probably got 15 yards maybe 20 yards before that becomes a real issue. He looks like he's going to start angling toward that scrape. And as long as he does that, I'll have time to slip around the other side of the tree. He's going to have to cross these cedars, which will give me some time to get around the tree where he won't see me. And I'll be able to draw and take a strong side shot around the, around the tree to that scrape. No problem. I, and I thought for sure hundred percent, that's what he was going to do, which is why I didn't make any kind of aggressive move to take the weak side shot. And then as fate would have it, he never, he flattened out his angle and now he's going to come right behind me. So now I have zero shots. So now the only thing I'm hoping for is that I get like a kick up of wind or something to help like just send my scent away from him long enough to where he can get behind me to get to like my right shoulder where I can make a little drop step and take and take a quick shot. And I wasn't going to be that lucky as the way <clears throat> as the way this season's been playing out. And uh, he got directly downwind of me at this point right behind me. I think, you know, my best shot opportunity was at about 14 yards. Um, and then whenever he finally figured out, you know, there was something going on, he was at about five yards. Um, and I had no shot and I had to just kind of, I'm watching him out of my peripheral, out of my peripheral vision, kind of like behind to the side of me and I turned in my head and, uh, I just had to watch him bound off. He didn't blow. He didn't like spook hard and take off running. Like I watched him just kind of stiff legged back up, turn around, walk back where he came from. And then I saw him just, you know, tail up walking through the woods, you know, headed north, uh, away from me. And that was that, that was the encounter. Um, you know, I've known or feel felt like that spot was going to be good, you know, all year. Um, it's a brand new spot to me. So, you know, trying to figure it out, um, you know, I've had, you know, one other buck encounter that, that was in there. And that's, so, I mean, that's pretty good in, in, in terms of, um, you know, three hunts and, and two buck encounters at that scrape. So that's not, those aren't bad odds, but what I figured out, Whenever, after the fact, I was actually talking to my buddy Chad um, about this, and because I was sitting there after the after it happened, of course I was disgusted and kind of mad at myself for making a rookie mistake. If I just would have picked my bow up as soon as I knew that it was a deer, I could have turned and you know had a shot opportunity and then decided at that point whether or not I was going to shoot. So total rookie mistake on my part, um, you know, learning lesson there. Uh, but what I was trying to figure out after the fact was like, why didn't he turn to that scrape? I mean, why wouldn't he go to that? go to that scrape. I know there had been does that had hit it in the past, like two days. Um, and was just kind of not sure why he didn't make that turn. Like, I, I mean, I would have put money on, he was going to turn, turn to that scrape. And what it dawned on me was all those trails that are in this area are running predominantly. The deer are always kind of at some point making their way to the water. Like if you, now that the, the water is down in this particular area, when I kayak in, I can kind of see as I'm looking at the shoreline, like the places where they're going to pop out, like it's beaten down because it's all muddy there. Right. So it's like, you can see where they're getting in and out. And actually where I park my kayak, I'm really close to one of the places where they're kind of headed to the water's edge. And I've looked around that area and there's some rubs around there and stuff like that. And so deer are coming up from the water at some point, whether they're going down to get a drink or whether it's just, you know, there's better security down there because it's thicker or less people are down there because it's close to the water's edge or whatever the case is. Um, you know, there's a lot of the trails are, that are moving or are coming are coming up from the water running perpendicular to the water. So what that deer was doing, and it made total sense this time of year, you know, bucks run down, maybe, maybe that's a factor. Maybe it's not in my mind. I was thinking that it is, and he's searching for that you know, last hot doe that he can breed. And the most efficient way for him to do that is not to go check every scrape. It's probably to walk that water's edge and cut horizontally across, like rut, walk parallel to the water and cut every doe track that's going to come up from the water, as opposed to trying to hit, you know, each individual scrape area to check for does. He sent checking doe, these doe trails. So 
I would liken it, and the, the reason it dawned on me was that, you know, oftentimes you'll see if you're hunting in ag, ag country, you'll see, you know, all these trails leading directly into food sources perpendicular if you're hunting a farm, right? Those trails are typically doe trails, right? That's how does are, or does and young deer, they're getting, they're making a beeline directly going in. A lot of times you'll find like a bench or like a faint trail that is cutting all those that are running perpendicular, uh, to those trails or crossing them all in horizontal and running horizontally to that primary food source. And what that oftentimes is, is a trail that bucks will use to cut doe tracks as they're heading into that food source. They know that they're all going to aggregate there at some point. So all they need to do is cut all those trails, say once a day for the purposes of this conversation. And they'll know what has come through there within the past 24 hours and hit that and hit that food source. And then once they find that hot doe, what trail she used, now they can figure out what direction she went and then go track her down. So that was kind of my epiphany there. It was like, that's how they're using that spot. So, um, you know, I don't know if any of these other deer I've been chasing in this spot are alive or not. Um, I think I'm going to make one more hunt on this spot and slightly tweak, uh, tweak my setup to, to kind of account for that, uh, that mishap that I had. Um, there's a couple other trees I could p- potentially get into and kind of play that setup. I still always want to have a shot to that scrape, um, because deer are still hitting it. Um, but I think I'm going to play a little bit more of those, you know, horizontal trails that are cutting those, those doe trails. So with that, that's kind of the update for what's been going on since I've been back. I really only had a chance to get out and hunt once. Uh, and with that, we'll just kind of go ahead and shut this part of the session down and get jumped into our podcast. But before I do that, I want to make a quick mention that, um, Skull Brew Coffee Company, you know, the coffee company that my wife and I own, We've launched a couple new products. Uh, so if you've not been over to skullbrewcoffee.com uh, and checked it out recently, you might want to he- head over there and do so. If you are into good coffee and you like travel coffee and you don't want to use instant coffee, we have some killer uh, backcountry pack single use pour overs that we uh, have on the site now. Uh, I think the pre order is over right now, so we'll have those actually in hand to be able to ship those out here probably within the next uh, within the next week or so. Uh, so head over there and check those out. And we also have some shirt apparel swag. We have a killer uh, thermal hoodie, which is probably my favorite, and then some T-shirts as well. So be sure to head over to SkullBrewCoffee.com and check those things out. So with that, today we have a killer show. We have uh, part number three with Steve Shirk. We know Steve. We love Steve. Mountain buck hunter. Uh, getting after. Guides some folks on public land. This is all pub- all public land. And Steve is well known for being able to get on mountain bucks and putting them on the ground and also putting other people on, on mountain bucks. And the first two sessions we covered was really, you know, early season, how he's getting after an early season. We've talked about rut and this session here today, we're really going to focus on the time frame and the period of time that we're in now, which is that, you know, maybe tail end of rut post rut time period where you might find a few cruising bucks, maybe looking for that last doe. And then we do start to talk about a little bit of gun hunting, uh, in the, in the later part of the season, um, as the, uh, tradition and holiday as we, as it were here in Pennsylvania is upon us, which will be opening Saturday where a lot of folks will be taken to the woods, uh, trying to fill their buck tags. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening and happy Thanksgiving. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And we are on to episode number three or segment number three with Steve Shirk, where we are talking about hunting the big woods, mountain bucks. We've already covered early season, pre-rut and rut. And then during this segment, we're really going to focus on that post-rut time period, maybe tickle a little bit of quote unquote late season, might even talk a little bit of uh a little bit of gun hunting, but I, I appreciate Steve coming on for the third installment. It's uh, you, you made it through, uh, you get some type of award for spending three episodes with me. I'm not sure what it is, you know, as a podcast host, we're pretty broke. So, you know, we might be able to buy you like a, you know, like a Coke or something like that. Maybe some of that skull brew coffee. Would there be you good. go. We could do some skull brew coffee. Yeah. We could, we could surely make that happen. So, all right, man, we're going to get right down to it, right down to brass tacks. So, you know, you and I were talking off air just a little bit. Like, I, I truthfully struggle, you know, basically after, after rut, like in, in that mm-hmm. time frame around Thanksgiving and after, like I've started spending more time and focusing more on that. Um, cause I okay. do know that you can find a slob kind of looking for love late, you know what I mean? During, during yeah. that time of year, you know, but I struggle typically, whether it's big woods, whether it's small parcels, whatever the case is, just generally this time of year has not been you know, been kind to me. So, 
you know, whenever you get to that post rut time period, you know, or, you know, we can even say gun season or whatever the case might be, you know, Mm -hmm. where does your focus start to shift in order to start to locate these mature bucks? Cause it's a, you know, most of the breeding has been done chasing's over, you know, the, the, the super bowl's done, so to speak. Right. Is there a particular place you're looking for site? Ter, you know, particular habitat that you found that they prefer or a terrain feature, or I, I'm really just casting a wide net here. Cause I'm like, for the love of God, I need some help. <laughs> I'm sure. Not sure where no, to start. I, so where, where do you, where do you kind of focus in to find these mature deer? Um, I'll still find them. It's almost similar to like the early season where even though there's a little bit of rutting going on, but they're, they're kind of back to that more bedding daytime pattern where, uh, as much as they need to, uh, start, uh, refilling those, you know, preserves that they've, you know, went through during the rut, uh, especially on public land, like, you know, gun seasons coming through and even bear season seems to, uh, uh, influence, you know, a lot of deer activity because of the pressure. Um, it just seems that the bucks then are related more to cover than anything else. And it can really like throw a guy off because most hunters, especially deer hunters, like, everyone's been out there during the rut in November. It's just been like, you know, you'll see bucks from all over the place showing up and, you know, it gets you all excited and you think you're onto something. And then all of a sudden gun season starts and it's a night and day, night and day scene out there. Like, uh, you know, you just went from deer running around like crazy in front of you in the particular area. And then you'll go out there and just nothing's happening. And that's because, uh, from, from uh, some, you know, those things I just mentioned and mainly, mainly due to, uh, you know, it's kind of like a post rut recovery period and that's influenced also by pressure. They're, they're back in those bedding areas for the most part. Right now. Are you, <clears throat> are you seeing them prioritize any type of, any type of food? Cause I mean, that's the one thing like in the big woods where it's like, there's mm-hmm. not an ag source, you know, so they're, they're not hitting a bean field or, you know, or, a, or a cut corn field and, you know, picking out the sugar, right. From, you know, yep. th- that their bodies are kind of wanting or needing to, to boost the, the caloric intake. But is there any type of food, you know, I- I'm assuming probably like some hard mass that's, that's still oh, yeah. left over from like the, you know, from the earlier part of the year, that's not been rotted or whatever the case is, but are, is there any type of browse you see them kind of gravitating toward, or is there a species of tree that like maybe holds their leaves a little bit longer that they, that maybe is still palatable? Like, is there any of that type of stuff that you're noticing? I would say the most common browse that time of year would be like blackberry briar. Uh, hmm. I find, uh, even though, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people notice that they eat it, but I'm still amazed they do eat it because of all the little thorns on it. Like, yeah. uh, I've probably seen bucks in the blackberry briar, that type of browse, like at least that time of year, because there's not a lot of green available, green type browse or grassy browse. Um, I've seen them, in the blackberry stuff, uh, late season, more than any other, any, any food source except acorns. It's either, uh, but I will say if we're going to bring up acorns, like if you have a good acorn crop in a certain area, that will, that's going to definitely be the main food source in the winter time. Right. Yeah. And the one thing I just recently learned, and it might be, you know, shame on me, but I learned probably in the past two years that white oaks and red oaks drop at different times. Yep. And they're, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's like an 18 month like cycle that red oaks drop and, and they're, that's, and they're that's something like I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And they're, and they're off schedule from white oaks. And so those first ones that hit the ground, of course, the deer want the most of the white oaks, they're the, they're the ones they prefer. And then they'll usually let the red oaks lay yep. until the white oaks are gone. And then they'll, they'll start hitting those in, in, in late season. So finding some other yep. type of subspecies of oak that might drop off the cycle of a white oak could be your, you know, a really good bet, especially if it's in and around a bedding area for that time of year. I would imagine. Yep. And, and just to give some tips on acorns too, like here, I actually see it a little bit different. Um, I see more activity usually in the red than the white. And I, I don't think that the, it's, you know, that some magically our red oaks taste better than the whites. My theory is, is, we have quite a few bears around here and I, whenever we have a good white oak crop, I see so much bear activity in those areas where I literally hardly want to go in there. (laughs) So I think that they, they pressure the deer a little bit in those spots and kind of push them out. So I focus more on red oak than anything here. 
Um, and I think that could be the case in a lot of, like, especially Pennsylvania, a lot of the mountainous areas, big woods, because I think our bear population is getting bigger and bigger. Um, I would tell people, don't throw all your money in too early on the white oaks because I've, I've seen it go completely opposite. Hmm, that's interesting. I never thought, I never thought of that, that competition where it's yep. like they're pushing. And another thing about white oaks is, is they, they don't last as once they hit the ground, I think they'll probably last, you know, maybe a month or so. Then they start to get moldy and mushy. Um, mm-hmm. Red oaks, they'll, if a red oak that drops in November, if it doesn't get eaten, it will probably still be good in March or April. So uh, they they are a really good late season acorn, probably the best actually. Nice, yeah. That's a. Uh, I found a couple stashes near me, um, but sure. no 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 dice. I think the one well the one stash I just completely bypassed because it's near a swamp and it was I was pretty sure it was a red oak that was dropping, but it was yep. so wet in there like there was nothing that was <laughs> you know because it was on the edge of a swamp like literally on the edge of cattails and it's like a dynamite spot that I found that'll be great for most likely October, right? Because it's going to, yep. you know, be a great spot, but you know, late yep. season, I was hoping to hoping it would hold up, but it was just, it was destroyed. There, <laughs> was, there wasn't anything there worth, worth eating at that point. But, you know, sure. so, so when we hit this time of year, we talked a little bit about food, yep. you know, what, uh, is there a sign in particular that you're paying attention to this time of year? Like, are you, I know you're a little further North than me, of course. Um, so are you, are you doing any, you know, cutting of tracks, you know, you know, are you relying more on your historical trail camera data or are you relying on like maybe a visual you had seen, maybe you were out scouting or something like that, you know, late season and you ended up seeing a buck somewhere, jumped him out of a bed or, you you know, what are you relying on this time of year to kind of get a, get a sense of where these deer are at? Yeah. Well, I think, I think a lot of it is yeah, prior late season scouting, as long as the winter isn't bad because winter weather, uh, can cause a major shift in deer activity too. Like they can, they can move miles away to find a place that's more suitable for them to survive the winter. But if the, you know, if we don't, if we're not into bad winter yet, um, a lot of it, what I do is going to be based on what I've seen in that area prior years, you know, scouting. Plus I leave my, I leave my cameras up, you know, for, for the most part year round. So, uh, you know, a lot of it too is based on, you know, camera Intel, but, uh, one thing too, like you'll get misled. Um, you'll, if you watch TV, read magazines, you'll probably hear more about hunting food sources late season than anything. Yeah. And, and just, I have found that, uh, just because, like I said, I think with our, with our bear season, there's a lot of pressure, but I don't find a lot of feeding activity except at night for mature bucks. I'll catch does and small bucks you know, well, well before sundown, but it seems like the bigger deer know what's going on and they, and they'll relate more to those bedding areas and hold tight till, you know, right before, right before it gets dark. Um, I think finding something in, but you, you have, may have better luck in between the food in, in bedding. Like I, I also think though that bucks may move even a little more the last hour uh, than they would maybe like early October. Like, I don't think there's hardly a buck laying on his belly and, and later in the season, you know, right until dark, but uh, there's just not a lot of bucks literally down in, at the food source, um, you know, before, before it gets dark. Right. And, and one other thing too, like, you know, guiding, especially last year, um, we, the first week of the season, um, we were catching some bucks uh, in the food. And what we actually found was, they were they were so wore out they were laying in the food too <laughs> like and this wasn't this was like you know oak that might have been up on the ridges and more of a maybe more suitable bedding related situation but then once you bump them like one or two times then it was that area that that was done till night like they were showing up on the cameras but they would not they wouldn't come in so they're extremely cautious of of pressure that time of year like you might get one or two chances and then, then it's over with. Yeah, man. The, the bucks that time of year, it's like if you get an opportunity, you better make good on it. Cause he's not going yeah. <laughs> to, he's not, he's not going to play the game any, any more than nope. any more than that. You know, the one thing you mentioned yep. about the food, like where you're, you know, you were seeing like really kind of relating more to the betting than the food necessarily. I had, yep. you know, everyone out there listening probably knows who Don Higgins is. I had him on and we talked a bunch about late season at one point. Cause that's actually, I think, one of Don's 
favorite times to hunt is that late sure. season time period. And he had a sure. captive, deer, uh, captive deer herd for a bunch of years. And one thing that he learned, and he dropped this piece of knowledge on me here, and it's just relevant to what we're talking about because it kind of lines up with what you're, what you're saying, where he said, you know, everyone has this idea that, you know, bucks need to like, you know, feed nonstop after the rut to try to replenish their body. He is like, and then his captive deer herd and just like he's got a biologist that was that's on staff with him for making his feed and stuff like that. He's like, mm-hmm. just isn't just isn't true. You know, he oh, was really? like, yeah, he was like their their bodies are built in such a way that their metabolism throughout the year slows. He's like, because if their metabolism yeah. stayed the same as it was in the you know summer and fall in yep. late season, they would die yep. because there's just yep. not enough food for them that time of year. So their body self-regulates that to where they slow their metabolism. And they can go last longer periods of time without caloric intake, which is another reason why they won't move a lot because they're trying yep. to, they're trying to conserve at that, at that point. He said the it only day, so yeah. And he said the only days that he consistently sees good mature deer out on a food source. And for him, it's, you know, he's got a farm and he's got, I think some other properties that he hunts that are farms and stuff like that is that, you know, they'll go to like a bean field or something like that. Is he said the coldest, nastiest, worst weather day that you can possibly imagine he's like is the day that i'm going to go hunt he's like because you can bet your bottom dollar the deer that weren't feeding prior to that are going to feed that day he's like they They will all be out yeah and it just goes back to think like if you think about it even just you know anecdotally when you're driving around and you know a storm's coming how many deer do you see in the field prior to like right before a storm sure i mean they know that that's the last opportunity to get food right or in the middle of a storm if it's really cold because it's like they just couldn't they couldn't take it anymore you know? Yep. And so that was something that was really interesting to me. So it becomes less about food unless the weather's just gnarly. And it goes back to what you were saying, which is it's now become all about betting and security again for them. That, yeah. I, I'm totally in agreement with that. And one thing that kind of proves that is, um, the buck that some of your listeners probably even, uh, know of that I call Goliath. Like it was the day after Christmas one year when I jumped him out of a bed in his wintering area. And I told myself, I, you could just tell it was like the most perfect wintering spot. I said, I'm not going to even come back in here till the spring when I know he dropped his antlers. And that same bed that I jumped that buck out of, that's where his shed's laid. So I almost think that these bucks may move so little to a point where it's like a semi-hibernation. Mm-hmm. Like he probably would some days just hardly get up, I bet, and just laid in that bed. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that makes it so hard. I think, you know, I'm just thinking of this now, but I think there's some commonalities between, you know, late season or post post rut kind of hunting and that, um, what people would refer to as the October lull. And, and, and look, I yep. guess, let me say it this way. Like I know in the lull, like the deer are moving still, right. Cause we know that they move more yeah. throughout the season. Right. But I yep. think that understanding like how, what they're prioritizing and where that priority yep. is for them, I think helps you find find those deer, right? Because in in October, even though you know they're moving more, they might be moving more, but they may only be moving in a small bedding area, right? Exactly. Like in a security kind of area. And so you have yep. to figure out where that's at to find them. I yep. think in late season, it's very similar to where it's like they're going to stay in that bedding area. But now it becomes even harder because now their body, the biology of their body is allowing them to not even have to get up. Exactly. You know yep. what I mean? To where now it becomes, you know almost going from hunting bedding areas to hunting beds at that yeah. point. You know what I mean? Like, cause I mean, there's some guys that you know, I, I'm not one of those guys. I mean, I'll find beds here and there, but like, you know, there's some guys that I've had on that they will hunt a buck in a bed and shoot it in his bed. You know what yep. I mean? Like, <laughs> and if that's what you can do, then I think you're and you're in pretty good shape. But otherwise, like, you know, a guy like me, like you're probably, you're gonna probably have a rough late season. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I get you. And, and that's another point too. I've made like people, you know, shed hunting. Like I, I even start shed hunting as early as like, I've seen bucks drop, uh, in December before, but I don't go into any bedding areas till at least March, if not April. Like okay. just because I know, like, it, it just seems like, cause those bucks, when they, when they found a wintering bedding area, they, that's where it's at. Like, we talked about earlier in the season when bucks shift their bedding some, like you find, you know, where the buck bedding area is, that's the area. They didn't, they rarely shift like from ridge to ridge or mm-hmm. they got a spot. So I don't want to mess with that at all. Just for the fact that 
I don't need those bucks to relocate because I if if they stay there, if, as far as a shed hunter or whether I'm even hunting them, like if you if you don't press if you if you limit the pressure to that spot, they're actually easy to locate. Right. Do you see yep. any shifting during that time of year, just rel- relative to the weather? So, like you know, for example, you know, say they're bedding on Ridge A, right, and that's yep. like their their primary bed. That's their winter wintering bed, right? Yep. But say that there's like a sleet coming. There's going to be you know, five days of like sub zero temperatures with sleet and snow and whatever. Like, do you see them shift to thermal cover and bed in that thermal cover during that period of time and then maybe shift back? Or do you, if they found Mm -hmm. a bed that they like, are they, are are they just staying in it? I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's all weather related. Like, Mm uh, uh, they'll, it's all of a sudden. Cause like, at least I know where I'm at. Like we're supposed to have like really bad winters up here. Well, like the past four or five years, like, I feel like I'm living like in Virginia or something because (laughs) we had like, we'll have like a 50 or 60 degree day in January, February, sometimes a week of that. So what I've noticed is like the weather definitely is causing those deer to get up and move. Um, Now, when it gets really cold and bad, I mean, a lot of it's like down lower on the ridges, evergreen cover, south sloping, usually not that far from food though. Or then you get a stretch in ice weather. It's almost like a, it's almost like a mini rut scenario where the cameras are blowing up and finding bucks in places that I wouldn't expect them to be in the winter. So I do think the weather causes a lot of shifting because you know, maybe deep down, if it's nice out, I'm sure a buck is kind of anxious to get up. If it's if it's been brutally cold for you know weeks or days, and all of a sudden 50 degree temps come just like you or me, we're probably like, all right, it's time to get up and stretch the legs and take a walk. And I think some of them will, will even move to new areas then because they know that it, that they can survive. They don't have to, you know, fight the, the air conditions, the winds and the snow and things like that. Right. I was just thinking of something while you were talking. I was like, you know, knowing that in the big woods, at least in my experience, I, I don't find a lot of beds that are like worn down to the dirt. Like people will find like a classic buck bed or whatever, where it's like, you know, yeah. two inches worn into the ground, like where he's, you know, been there for forever. I've really yep. only ever found probably two in my limited experience that would fit that kind of mold. I find a lot more that are just casual use and look, casual use might be that he beds there all summer and then mm-hmm. leaves, you know, or he beds there only for rut and then that's it, you know? I'm wondering yep. if in the big woods, because when they find an area that's safe and gives yep. them what they need for like their wintering bed, right? I'm wondering if those beds that you find that are kind of worn to the ground or into the into the dirt, I'm wondering if those are more often wintering beds than they are any other time of year, since they're I less think inclined. You the to nail on the head. Yeah, I I have pictures because I mean, obviously, you know, I'm in the woods a ton year round, like. I have pictures of winter buck beds that there's not a leaf, there's not a, a strand of grass, twig. It's just all dirt. And is, and, there, and is there any and is there any rubs around it or anything like that, or are those pretty benign for sign? Just just a few, not a lot. No, okay. nothing nothing that would get you like holy cow, like this is this is crazy. And what I think it is is it's just a wintering bedding area, and you're probably not going to see a lot of rubbing and sign mm-hmm. making that time of year because. It's just not a time of year when bucks are as territorial as other times. Mm-hmm. So maybe they'll throw a rub down here and there, but I don't see as much sign in the winter bedding or near it as I do like different times of the year. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. That just made me think of that because I was just only because, you know, I'm always looking for that classic big bed and I've just not nope. found a lot of them. And when I did find them, they didn't have a ton of sign around them and they were kind of in peculiar places where I was like, why is it bedding here? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what's the benefit of this spot versus like the twenty other areas that I checked that could have been that would be, that were better? You know what I mean? Yep. We talked about those blackberry briars, and if you got if you got like a ton of blackberry briar with like good winter or uh, evergreen, like you know hemlock or pine, or like mm. you'll find like that's an awesome wintering bedding area. That's um, and I count it like those spots like the same bucks winter every year, so it, it just got to be the right habitat. And, uh, then that's where you'll, that's where you'll find it being more consistent. Right. And then do you find, you know, is a lot of this that you're finding, is it in and around those, those cuts that you kind of prioritize yep. those? Yep. The blackberry briar is like some of the newest growth that would come out of a fresh cut. Like, 
a one to five year old cut should have a lot of blackberry in it most of the time. Nice. And so that one to five year old cut would probably be if you were out if you're out there listening and you're hunting big woods and trying yep. to find deer where they might bed and be able to feed at the same time and have a little luck, luxury, that would be the, the place I'd probably prioritize that. It, it could be a great spot for a rifle hunter too. Like, cause if you get up in a tree, um, that, that covers probably anywhere from three to five foot high. Mm-hmm. And some of those cuts, you know, are pretty, pretty expansive. Like you might be able to see 300 yards and you could almost pop a buck right in his bed. Now maybe he'll see you, but maybe he won't. Mm-hmm. Um, so that could make for an ideal, you know, late season rifle spot. Nice. Well, yep. with that, man, did we cover uh, a late season post rut well enough or just, did we miss anything? Um, you know, other than, you know, I always bring up like, uh, I think the late, we call it the late season or post rut, whatever, or even when season ends, like just, I would encourage people make sure that's not the end of season. That should be the start of the season. Mm-hmm. Say you're a guy also that um, you might have filled your archery tag in late October, early November, or, you know, that's that's the best time of the year to get out there and get the homework done. So uh, uh, if we're going to call it the late season, let's call it the start of the next year as well. That's I like I love hearing that, man, because, look, I look forward to the day when I don't have a tag in my pocket. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> um, yep. you know I, I botched, well, I didn't botch. I had a couple near misses last year with, you know, getting dark deer on a couple target deer. So I had a tag late into the year, but that is mm-hmm. like a cool, one of the things if I, it, you know, when I do fill a tag earlier in the year, I still do yep. like to go out and just even in areas that I've maybe looked at on the map and I've not had a chance to hunt. It's like, I'll yep. go and just like I'm hunting, walk in and set up in a tree and just sit, you know what I mean? And watch and just see yeah. what, yep. you know, or I'll go cover ground, you know what I mean? On, on an area that I want to check out. So I think that's a good point, man. It's, it's, you know, there, I always say there's no intelligence better than a firsthand experience. Right. And so, Absolutely. you know, you can't, trail cameras help us a ton. You know, it's like, they tell us a lot of information, you know, and, yep. um, but there's nothing to substitute that firsthand encounter. So. No, oh, if you can go out and not have to worry about disturbing deer and changing their travel patterns or feeding patterns, you know, due to spooking them, that's the time of year there's no better time of year than then. So, you know, just don't make it, don't make it the end of season and time to hang the boots up, make it the, the start of next year as soon as you can. Well, on that note, man, I think that's the perfect place to wrap this entire series. But before I let you go, buddy, if you wouldn't mind, uh, let people know where they can find out more about Steve Shirk and follow along with him. Sure. Yeah. I encourage anyone to, uh, if you, if you have access, look me up on social media, Facebook or Instagram, it's Shirks, S-H-E-R-K apostrophe S. I always say that because a lot of people think it's S-H-I-R-K. So it's <laughs> S-H-E-R-K apostrophe S, guide service, or uh, check out my website, um, shirksguideservice.com. And uh, I look forward to getting to know, uh, you know, so many great people that I've, that I've already been able to get to know through this. Uh, the more, the better is the way I look at it. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you spending three episodes with me, man. Uh, I'm, I'm sure people are going to be getting a lot of good information from this and uh, let's make sure to stay in touch during the season. I hope you have a uh, continued success, my friend. Same to you, bud. Thanks. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. If you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast and hell. While you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there as well. I'd be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Skull Brew Coffee Company, and Maven Optics. And until next time, we'll see y'all.